Welcome to this episode of Jadal TV in English. Uh, tonight is Sunday, 14th of April, almost like uh, 15 minutes to midnight. And it's Monday already in Iran and in the parts of West Asia, people who are watching the program. Uh, last night, at this time, Iran finally delivered its promises that it will punish Israel and it sent over 300 missiles and drones towards the occupied land and uh, the videos have been coming out from from different parts of israel of uh, the sky being brightened up by by the iranian attack but since then there are a lot of speculations as how significant iranian attacks have been and also the details of this multi-layered complicated uh, attack where, which is like uh, orchestra, orchestrated in a very sophisticated way combination of many different uh, weapons from drones to missiles and different kind of mess missiles and then from the other side israelis who have been claiming that the attack has not been significant and 99 percent of what has been sent to Israel has been intercepted by, by the Israelis. And, and also finally the question that Israelis, some of them are saying that they will respond to this, they will retaliate and they want to escalate. And, and then the West saying that we don't want to do it. One way or another, it's a very important moment, it's a historical moment that we are witnessing and it possibly will be very influential in shaping the the regional order uh, and it will change the equations tonight once again i'm going to be with uh, professor uh, muhammad marandi that you know much better than me and uh, we're going to discuss uh, the details of the attack yesterday and also i'm going to ask him in relation to what we discussed in the previous program as how much of the predictions that he made has come true and also what Iranians will do if Israel will retaliate. Good night, Mr. Marandi. I know that you've been extremely busy in the last 24 hours. I think you had more than 15 interviews. Is it true? I I don't know how many interviews I've had, but it I've been, yes, I've been very busy. I think probably more than that. <laughs> more than 15. And, and I have to say, it's a bit embarrassing, but... I caught Mr. Marandi between two interviews. I think he was in Al Mayadin and he's going to a Chinese thing. And in between, I just caught him and I asked him to do it. And uh, he's suffering from uh, acute kindness. And so he couldn't say no. <laughs> so he's like a bit shy, like many Iranians. And he did tar off. And so so I got got him. But I think, I have, I think you haven't slept for the last uh, 48 hours. Uh, last night I didn't sleep. I slept at uh, 7 in the morning or six maybe and then i got up at eight and uh i've been busy till now it's 1 19 a.m in tehran wow and and just so uh, you've been watching the videos as well which has come out one after another i actually i've been so busy with media since last night that i probably I I probably know less about what's going on than most other people, or at least many other people. So I've been seeing, a, I've been reading a bit of news here and there, but I've been very busy. Okay, uh, because I was going to ask you, I mean, how did you feel personally? And I'll start with a bit of personal question, because I think it's a significant moment. I mean, watching the videos, watching the the storm of missiles and and drones coming down on Israel after about four decades of shadow war suddenly this war almost <laughs> if you can call it war but this operation suddenly became very true especially for us iranians who in the last 7 18 20 years since 2002 2003 israel has been doing one after another uh, operation inside iran assassinating iranian nuclear scientists uh, Stuxnet, which led to death of many of the Iranian scientists and engineers and people who worked in nuclear, Iranian nuclear facilities, and it was a very dangerous operation, and possibly a lot of sabotages 
inside Iran over the years in power plants and other places leading to arson and to damages and finally uh, assassination of Professor Fakhri Zadeh, Iran's grand scientist in 2021 and, and then also a lot of attack on Iranian military advisors in Syria. And so <laughs> it seems that Iran finally had it and went out of patient. So to start with, I mean, can you explain a bit of like the operation yesterday and uh, l last night? How significant was it from military point of view and what do we know about it so far? Well, first I, I should point out that um, the reason why the Israelis have murdered a number of scientists, why they've carried out sabotage uh, with American assistance and European assistance on many occasions, carried out sabotage against the Iranian nuclear program and other uh, Iranian uh, um, infrastructure. The reason why this is done is because of Iran's support for the Palestinian people and for the Palestinian cause. Uh, so while the Israeli regime has been carrying out these acts of murder and these crimes against ordinary Iranians with Western support, the Iranians were building up the capabilities of the resistance in Gaza, Lebanon, in Yemen, in Iraq, in Syria, and of course, uh, according to the West, in the West Bank as well. So I think that if we uh, compare the two, uh, the Iranians have had the upper hand. The difference is that uh, the Israeli regime uh, carries out crimes against ordinary Iranians, whereas the Iranians support an, a resistance that have been displaced, ethnically cleansed, and uh, want to return to their own homes, uh, which is a, a, lit a legitimate uh, demand. With regards to what happened last night, uh, yes, the, the equation has changed. Uh, until now, the Iranians have been uh, showing a great deal of strategic patience when the Israelis would carry out assassinations or when they would murder Iranian soldiers fighting ISIS and Al-Qaeda in Syria or supporting the resistance uh, in Syria. Um, and of course, during the last few months, during the genocide in Gaza, the Iranians continued to suffer casualties in Syria uh, at the hands of uh, the Israeli Air Force. And uh, the re Iranians, they, they continued with this strategic patience because the dirty war in Syria needed to be contained. They didn't want to expand it to uh, Israel at that time, they had to secure Syria from these terror groups. And then in the last few months, they didn't want to change the narrative to be shifted away from Gaza to Iran or Syria. So they refrained from directly retaliating. But this came to an end when the Israelis struck the Iranian embassy, because that was an attack on Iranian sovereignty. Uh, and that gave Iran a very good opportunity to punish the Israeli regime because what the Israelis did outraged the world. I mean, forget the fact that Western regimes supported the Israelis in the UN Security Council, the US, France, and Britain. Um, they refused to allow Israel to be condemned, let alone, alone punished for bombing the Iranian embassy. Uh, they, of course, think that uh, the law of the jungle is uh, the most appropriate law for our region. That's why they support the genocide. But uh, the Iranians said, no, we, we will punish the Israelis for this because if we don't, the Israelis are going to continue attacking Iran. So this is a, a this retaliation is a deterrence uh, to prevent further aggression. And, but what the West doesn't understand is that when the attack finally, after about nine or 10 days of mind games where the Iranians were effectively messing with the Israeli, the Israelis um, minds. Uh, the Iranians launched an attack last night and the West tries to depict this as a victory for themselves in Israel. 
But it's really the opposite. And the reason is that they say that Israel downed 90 or they and Israel combined. They had to all work together to counter Iran along with the Jordanians, uh, the French, the British, the Americans, uh, the Israelis and the Jordanians together. Uh, they um, they said they downed 99 percent of uh, the drones and planes, which isn't true because we have footage of more than one percent of the missile striking. But the point is that what they refrain from telling their public for obvious reasons is that in this sophisticated operation, the Iranians sent these drones, these very cheap, inexpensive drones in order to draw fire from the Israeli missile defense uh, units, which are very expensive. The, the missiles are extremely expensive. And there is a very limited number of them because many of them have, the, the production is, is not high and many are being used by the Ukrainians. So there's a huge shortage of these missiles and they're very expensive. So the Iranians sent these cheap drones and a series of old older missiles to for the Israeli air, air defense systems and missile defense systems to be activated and target them, both so that Iran could learn more about Israeli defense capabilities, but also in order to deplete the regime of their missiles. So effectively what Iran did is that they spent, I don't know, three or four million dollars altogether, uh, because, as I said, these drones are both old and the missiles were old and, and cheap. And this cost, the cost for the Israelis was uh, at least $1.3 billion uh, just for the drone, for, just for the missiles that they used to bring down these drones. Is the number so, accurate? I mean, how do we know about the number? Well, this, is, this came from the, the Israeli media. And uh, I could I could look it up and, and give it to you. But uh, the point they're, they're very expensive, and we we've seen the same thing in Ukraine. So the Russians have done the same thing in Ukraine. Whether you support Russia or not in Ukraine is irrelevant. The Drush the Russians would constantly send in these inexpensive drones that look very similar to Iranian drones, by the way. But for whatever reason, I won't get into that. But they send them so that the Ukrainians would constantly shoot them down. And the Ukrainians would always say, we've knocked down 99% of the Russian drones. But the stupidity of this policy is that it is very expensive to shoot down these drones. And it's very cheap for the Russians to send those drones. And so in reality, it's the Russians who are benefiting from this exchange. And this is the same concept that the Iranians used in uh, the operation last night. The Iranians learned a lot about the U.S.-Israeli defense uh, capabilities, but, at, but more importantly, they forced them to spend huge amounts of money to bring down drones that are very expensive. If I was just saying jokingly to friends that if, if these drones actually struck targets inside Israel, I'm not sure the damage would be as much as $1.3 billion. So uh, it wasn't a smart exchange, and they've depleted their air defense arsenal, very expensive and not worthwhile to have when you can use drones in, in the world today, inexpensive drones. But in any case, then the Iranians, after using these decoys, these uh, a couple of hundred, I guess, drones and, and old missiles as decoys. Then they sent, I think, a handful of missiles. Uh, I don't know the exact number, maybe 10 or 15 to strike or 20. I'm not sure uh, to strike two bases. The most well protected military bases in Israel. One is uh, an, uh, the uh, air base in the south, which where the F-35s are, and one is an intelligence gathering base, which belongs also to the Air Force in the north, if I'm not mistaken. And these are extremely well protected, and they struck them both. The, the missiles got through, and th there was footage of these, of these strikes. So, and in addition to that, uh, I, I, I should add 
that um, the Iranians did not target civilians, unlike the Israelis who carry out genocide and uh, they specifically target civilians in Gaza and they call them Amalek using biblical terminology and they blocked water and food and medicine from entering Gaza and imposed starvation and they intentionally bomb houses to massacre families. Uh, unlike the Israeli regime, this barbaric and backward regime, the Iranians targeted two military bases. So it was a very inexpensive uh, operation. Uh, the drones, the, the missiles that were supposed to get through, got through. And uh, this is a very tiny part of Iran's huge drone and missile arsenal. And uh, the most advanced missiles and drones have uh, yet to be used. That's, that's very so, interesting. Mm -hmm. so, the, so CNN and BBC and Sky News and unfortunately even Al Jazeera can repeat uh, what Western uh, and American and Isra Israeli officials say day and night and uh, pretend that this was a victory. But as I explained, it's the exact opposite. So every drone that is downed by the Israelis and where they fire two or three of these very expensive missiles, that's a defeat for the Israelis. That's not a victory. The intention is for these missiles to be uh, used uh, by the Israeli military. A, because they're very expensive. B, because they're hard to obtain and they're limited in number. And C, because Iran learns more about the Israeli defense capabilities, the American defense capabilities. And so when Iran wants to carry out a serious attack, let's say if the Israelis respond uh, and strike Iran, then the Iranians said they're going to carry out massive attacks. When those massive attacks happen, there will be a shortage of missiles. Iran will know a lot more about uh, the air defense mm -hmm. capabilities and the results will be devastating. So it doesn't matter what, if, you know, they can say that this is a huge victory all they want, but it's not going to change anything. Oh, that's, that's the important thing. I mean, it's, I mean, I think here we have to be a bit careful because visually they have been controlling the image very, very carefully. I mean, I've been, <laughs> for, for making the poster of for this program, I was looking for, uh, we're looking to find images relevant to the thing and the only image was used in every single western media outlet was this one three shooting that all of them have been intercepted whereas last night we saw a lot of videos including in jerusalem and other places that it was like a, a spring uh rainfall yeah and and many of them were hitting the floor, I mean, were hitting the ground. So, and, and none of these things have got to the front pages of newspapers. So, I mean, controlling the visual message has been uh, very tight. But you know, the Western media is, right. is discredited. People are increasingly ignoring these media outlets and they're going to alternative media. You know this, I know this, you, you yourself have... An alternative oh, we are in media alternative outlet. media now, of course. Yeah. But what I'm saying is people who haven't followed the social media, they might not have seen the video. That's because, true. But what's interesting, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show some of the videos now, but it's interesting that because the claim that only 1%, I mean, here we are like dealing with not only propaganda, but with like bad mathematics as well. They claim that only 1%, and look at that, I mean, there was a messaging from... Israel directly said PBS, which is a live update. Israel says it intercepted 99% of Iran's drones and missiles. And they claim that Iran has shot 300. So 1% of 300, you don't need to do um, advanced mathematics. It's three. And then I'm going to show you a video in which only in that video, three have passed through Iron Dome. That's one thing. So <laughs> much more than that. But I mean, let me just kind of give my take as well. <clears throat> And I think Iran did an interesting thing and used because Iran in this 
age of hybrid warfare, Iran is lacking the media appendix or media machinery to, in order to explain its action. That's why it's been turned into a boogeyman sometimes, it's been demonized easier, and there's a discrepancy between its military capability and its uh, media capability. And I think yesterday, IRGC and Iranian, uh, which is wrong to say IRGC because yesterday was all of Iranian defense uh, basic forces from army to IRGC to everything. But they used missiles as a form of media. First of all, it they shot from many Iranian cities, from Shiraz, from Isfahan, from Ahvaz, from Kermanshah, as if they wanted Iranian people inside who have been under media bombardment of Western Persian services, Western-based Persian services, instead of looking at their phone or the TV and watch the propaganda, listen, they could just look at the sky and see what's happening there. And also they shot through and via many different Israeli cities for Israeli citizens to see what's happening and not be <laughs> directed or channeled by by their uh, censorship inside Israel and by the government propaganda and uh, Hasbara. I think that's interesting because from now on, the Israeli citizens, every time they look at the sky, they remember that it's very easy for these Iranian drones and missiles to come through. And so whatever they, they can say, whatever they want to say. But, but the fact that all these missiles passed through Jordan, passed through many of the cities, and they got there, I think that will stay with Israeli memory for a very long time. That's one, one, <laughs> that's one point I want to say. And second point is, uh, let me just show you this one, because this, is been, uh, this has been circulated widely now. This one, that they say Iran didn't want to, because the contradiction is, until yesterday, all these pro-Israeli and pro-American, many are pro-American media outlets for saying that Iran doesn't dare to respond to Israel. Iran is weak, and this lack of response is not because Iran is avoiding war or tension, it's because Iran is weak. And as soon as they did, they say, oh, that was, they're trying to diminish Iran's response, and they think that that was not good enough. And one of the points that are uh, drawing attention to is the fact that Iran has informed some of its neighbors 72 hours in advance. It's, but, but what we know is Iran did not want to have a surprise attack. Iran had informed many, many partners that I'm going to do it. And I think that's important and significant because Iran said, I'm going to attack. I'm going to have a small, tiny, minuscule attack. Let's see how many of them you can catch. And from 300, they couldn't. They, 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 they didn't catch over between ten so, and twenty. So here, so here, there are a number of things that have to be uh, unpacked. One is that the reason why Iran informed its neighbors was because a Iran wanted, as I said, the the Israelis to um. You be and the Americans and the British and the French to show to to show everything that they have to put everything on the table. And as I said, any any sane per I mean, even if a person doesn't know much about military affairs, if you're sending a drone from Iran and you're going to wait for a couple of hours to get for it to get to uh, Israel, then obviously. Uh, the, I think it's obvious that the Iranians know that the Israelis are going to be preparing themselves to shoot it down. So why would Iran use drones in the first place? It could just fire missiles, which would be much easier. The reason is because the, the, the drones are dirt cheap. They're very, very cheap. So Iran can send a thousand drones and it wouldn't cost Iran much. But those missiles that the Americans and the British and the French use and the planes that they have to uh, to um, to use to fly and the fuel and, and all, it's a huge amount of money that they're spending. And they're giving Iran a huge amount of information to shoot down a drone that costs a few thousand dollars. So this is A. So they're, they, 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 they basically uh, 
did what Iran wanted them to do. Again, why would Iran send a couple of hundred drones or whatever uh, from all the way from Iran to to Palestine and let everyone know beforehand that this is going to happen? Why not just fire missiles? They'll get there within minutes because the objective was to draw fire. These were, these were decoys and, in, and Iran gained intelligence that way. So that's one issue. The second issue was that the Iranians wanted to tell the neighboring countries that had U.S. bases that, look, if the United States does anything to us, you bear responsibility. You are in trouble. You will be seen as hostile. What does that do? A, that puts pressure on these regimes or these family dictatorships to put pressure on the United States to to refrain from using their territory, A. B, it's also sending a message to these family dictatorships that the American presence, the American bases on your territory are not actually good for your security. They're putting you at risk because if the Americans do something that you don't want them to do and the Iranians see you as hostile, the Iranians will destroy your country. Your gas facilities will be destroyed. Your oil facilities will be destroyed. Your your family dictatorship will fall apart within days, if not hours. And these regimes in the Persian Gulf are all small and vulnerable. Saudi Arabia is, is very vulnerable. So all of them got the message that, look, the American presence is, in fact, detrimental to your security. Because if the Americans do something, the Iranians are going to hit you. So this encourages these regimes to distance themselves from the West and to uh, decrease the scope of uh, U.S. Uh, influence in those countries and uh, uh, decreases the chances that the United States will do something against Iran from their territory. So it has multiple, it, and telling these countries in advance has multiple advantages to Iran. It's also sending a message to the United States that warning the United States of the consequences. That if you attack us, then there will be no oil and gas anymore from the Caucasus to the Persian Gulf, and you will be expelled from the region. Your bases in Iraq and Syria will be overrun. In the Persian Gulf, they'll be destroyed. That will, it will bring down the global economy. So the Iranians have also established a balance of terror between themselves and the United States like the balance of terror between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. So it served many purposes to say things beforehand, but the Western media, because they've become increasingly like Soviet media or Saudi media, they're, they're, they become propagandists. It's silly. I, just today I was on a, a number of Western media outlets and like I would be sitting, it's, you know, the discussion is about Iran. And I would have to listen for 20 minutes about, you know, for the host to, to repeat the Western and Israeli narrative, then the guests in the studio, then their own analysts, all of them saying the same thing, then going to uh, Tel Aviv or Jerusalem and then hearing the pro-Israeli reporter there speak and then an Israeli speak. So t after 20 minutes, they would give me two minutes to talk. So it's, you know, it's, 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 it's obvious that Western media mm -hmm. is just repeating these propaganda points. And they may convince a segment of their population, even though those numbers are decreasing because mm -hmm. people are very skeptical of, of mainstream Western yep. media nowadays. They may fool a segment of their population. But what danger this has for the West is that their elites are actually the only ones left or among the small minority left that depend on the mainstream media. Ordinary people have gone on to alternative media for the most part. But the Western elites still depend on the mainstream media. So what happens is that their elites watch their own propaganda and then they believe their own propaganda. So it creates this echo chamber. They produce propaganda. Then they believe the propaganda and then they produce more propaganda. And that creates an environment 
from miscalculation. So, and that is why the West has lost all of its wars in our region. That's why it's, it has been, its policies have been mm. defeated in Latin America. That's why they've lost that's, that's, Ukraine. That's, that's, that's why they've lost across the world because they are stuck in this um, this uh, echo chamber. But, but as, 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 that see... echo chamber, as we say in Farsi, we say in Farsi, there's like a story which which is like someone, uh, a king in 19th century was ordering every uh, well digger to do wells and the, the diggers I said, there's no water here. He said, don't worry, there's no water for me. There's bread and kind of money for you. There's no uh, truth for the citizens in America and in the Western countries in terms of the regional wars in West Asia, whereas it was billions, uh, trillions of dollars for uh, military uh, industrial yes, complex. Of so, so, yes. so in 2000, all these wars have enriched 2011, these 2011, lobbyists every, and the military industrial complex and impoverished Western citizens. The United States today is, uh, you know, a very broken and weak country in, in compared to the United States of 40 years ago. In 2011, 2012, I mean, a friend of mine actually uh, has been on my uh, Farsi show many times. He made a documentary called Alone Among Taliban's. In 2012, he made it. And he shows that Taliban is the only force in Afghanistan and has control over 85% of land. And sooner or later, it will <laughs> occupy the whole land. And 2012, no one wanted to listen to because between 2012 and 2021, they pumped another trillion dollar of American taxpayers and they pushed it towards a kind of form of a form of plundering. So many people think that these like wars are only to plunder the money and resources of people across the world, but part of the plundering is from their own taxpayers as well. So they're doing it and so, like so, <laughs> yes exactly. So the, so the point is the point that I'm making is that when Western media, BBC, CNN, Sky News, Fox News, The Guardian, The New York Times, misinform their public and pro produce propaganda. They may score a few points here and there uh, through misleading part of the population, part of the public, and people beyond their borders as well. But at the end of the day, it's a loss for them because their calculations are based upon uh, false information. But, but that's the interesting and, thing because... And here, therefore, mm -hmm. their their actions are going to lead to results that are always unexpected to them. So they always think that, well, if I do policy, pursue policy A, B, C, and D, then uh, I should achieve these results. But then when they don't, they, they don't understand why. So this, this small video is about 20 seconds, actually shows one of the fallacies here. I mean, they're just going to go through it again uh, from beginning. There are three shots, three missiles which have gone uh, through uh, Iron Dome. Three only in one side is in Naqib, in south of Palestine, and that's the military base. And, and that three is only come more than 1%. And we had. Yeah, so that, these three, let us assume that Iran fired 300. And. Uh, that's what the West says. Iran hasn't confirmed those numbers. I don't know the numbers. Maybe Iran has. I, I haven't seen them because I've been so busy. But let's say Iran actually did um, uh, send 300 drones and missiles, mostly drones. But, okay, so th these three alone are 1%. And this is just one person with one camera. So, and there are there is footage of other examples as well. So obviously there is no 99%. The 99% reminds me of Ukraine because every time the Russians would fire drones and missiles at uh, Ukraine, at targets in Ukraine, the Ukrainian government would say, we down 99% of them. Today on this BBC and Sky News, I said, no, it's like, it's not 99%, it's 110%. Uh, it, it's I mean, it's ridiculous because as say, as okay, you say, keep, keep, has lost its its electricity, its infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, many parts of the country don't have electricity anymore, and they can pretend that they're knocking all these drones and planes down. But the reality on the ground is that Ukraine is losing the war, and the Ukraine is losing the ability to produce electricity and to warm people's homes and for people to have gas to cook. I mean, as you say, you know, that the, one of the kind of breaking news today in Iran was 
that uh, breaking news, not only no one got killed in Iran's attack on uh, Israel, but uh, three people were born. So like, not only like no one, so the attack caused like many births coming as well. So it's like basically like, like making making joke with it because they have gone all the way saying that only one Bedouin girl was injured and she's in hospital. They're getting better, and it's almost like they one of the military bases got chipped away. So, which is for, I mean, it's, it's okay, actually. I, I have no problem with it because I mean, in my understanding, I don't know, I, I would like to know your analysis. In my understanding, this is Iran's kind of very, very crafty. It's really artistic because it's not only showing muscles and military uh, power, and Iran has a lot of it, I think. We, we know that. And this was another uh, testimony to Iran's uh, military power. I mean, we've seen all these like missiles everywhere and there. So, I mean, from one side, they complain that Iranian drones are changing the equation in Ukraine war. And then from the other side, and they're bringing sanction after sanction after sanction. And now from the other side, they say, oh, they're not effective and they had no uh, military impact. Well, there, then, there, there, are two, there are three, a couple of things here. Uh, one is that they they have been saying that you know the Iranians are sending drones to Russia and it's 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 a game changer and uh, so if Iranian drone if these are truly Iranian drones and they are a game changer and that the West the collective West has been able not been able to do anything about it the Iranian drones uh, then must be very effective so why are they suddenly saying that they are ineffective in Israel uh, that's a and b Iran uh, the, the United States and the British uh, military were saying, and their governments were saying that we're going to, you know, knock out the Ansar Allah capabilities, the Yemeni government's capabilities in the Red Sea. After months, they failed, and no ship, no American, British, or Israeli, or a ship that's destined to, uh, that's that wants to go to Israeli ports, has been able to pass through uh, and get. To their destination. So obviously, uh, Yemeni drones and missiles uh, are very capable and very effective. And we know that Iranian drones and missiles are more advanced than uh, the drones in Yemen. So the, the narrative doesn't make sense, but it doesn't need to make sense because people in the West, at least those who are influenced by Western mainstream media, are so propagandized that they, they don't really you know, seek uh, the logic uh, of of the propaganda. Uh, otherwise, as I said, if they look carefully, they would see that uh, what Iran did was uh, very smart and uh, mm -hmm. very uh, inexpensive and very costly for Iran's adversaries. But but that's what I'm saying. It's very crafty because it is. It it, it was it somehow played in gray zone because. Not military-wise, because I'm sure the Israeli commanders now are studying the leftover of the missiles. They are looking at the satellite image, and they receive the message. They receive the fact that this is like, I mean, Hezbollah has 180,000 missiles, they say, in its arsenal. So you can imagine how many Iran has. I mean, a million. And this is a 300, yeah? And, and most of them drones. So they got the message, what Iran can do. And then let me just say, I don't, I'm not like a military expert, but... If this 300 would have become 600, because many of the the Iron Dome and other form of air defense, uh, their uh, magazines would have been emptied out. So many more of them would have gone through. Not only twice, it would be like triple or quadruple. And I so think you, got the it, Iran can send 3,000 drones simultaneously uh, to strike Israel. I mean, Hamas sent 5,000 in one and morning Iran on the 7th has of October. huge numbers of drones and uh, missiles. Iran has underground bases across the country. The reason why the United States does not want to get into a fight with Iran is that they know they cannot defeat this overwhelming drone and missile capability of Iran. And Iran actually made a very smart move by... Uh, at, by seeking advanced technology in this field, because these are much more, less expensive than conventional, uh, you know, by than than air aircraft F-35s are very expensive. So you and um, 
their maintenance is very expensive. So what Iran focused on during these years is to pursue technology that would be very effective and uh, uh, not not costly and, and, and inexpensive for the country. So while the United States pr produces aircraft carriers that are sitting ducks, if, if a, a surface to ship or ship to ship missile hits it, it'll sink. But uh, Iran doesn't do that. Iran goes for uh, key technologies that will have uh, that can have a significant impact and will be very uh, inexpensive for the Iranians to uh, produce. And uh, as a result, the axis of resistance is uh, has cornered both the Americans and the Israelis. But let me just finish my point. My point is, I think Iran's, as I said, is very artistic because Iran's message was very multi-layered from one side it sent a, one message to israeli, israeli citizens that we are here don't trust your government if you have a double nationality like many israelis have if you have american if you are coming from ohio you had a good life don't listen to their propaganda this is not going to be safe for you so if it's, it's the time to go <laughs> it's the time to go so if you feel unsafe about 7th of october you should feel unsafe twice more from uh, 14th of April. That's one message for the citizens. Second message was for Americans, as you said, that what we can do, just look and watch. I mean, there are. I mean, there was like um, even the missiles. They called them. I don't know. Uh, uh, that, that it was going to two different directions. Was uh, splitting. I don't. Know. We, we're gonna we're gonna wait and see the documents coming out. But the third one was Iran didn't want to escalate and move into a war. I think that's important. So they didn't want to destroy Israelis so much. They allowed them escape, escape road, uh, escape goat. So if you want to keep face and move away, is it is a place for you to do it? And that's the second time Iran is doing. First time was Ain al-Assad in January 2020 after the assassination of General Soleimani. Iran hit the American base in Iraq, but in a way that Trump could move away and look away. But one thing happened after that. Trump never, ever, never, ever threatened Iran again. If you remember, leading to January 2020, Trump would tweet once a month that we will nuke you. We will destroy 50 uh, of your like most <laughs> sacred and uh, loved sites in Iran. All options are on table. After that, never, ever... Americans never threatened Iran with military action again because they received the message and Iran's deterrence was 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 like established. And I think after this one as well, it doesn't matter what Israelis say. We're gonna wait and watch what Israelis would do. But I, I think I think Iran's deterrence was established and Israel deterrence well, the Iran, was massively Iran has compromised. The equation Iran has said that. Uh, from now on, if the Israelis strike uh, Iranian soldiers or Iranian assets ab abroad, then Iran will strike Israel from Iran. So the Israelis made this foolish decision because now, as a result, uh, their ability to um, uh, to use their military has been uh, has been lessened. Uh, the the theater in uh, you know their their theater of operation in Syria is going to be different in future or in Lebanon, so they made things more difficult for themselves as a result of the this foolish attack on the Iranian embassy and also uh, the uh, Israelis if they carry out an attack if they uh, carry out another act of aggression, let's say tonight or tomorrow night or next week uh, against Iran uh, in retaliation to Iran's retaliation. It's, it's, it's amazing. They started, they, they attacked Iran and now they, they want to attack, they want to punish Iran for responding. But, you know, that's, that's one of the things about these European uh, uh, supremacists that they see themselves as the center of the world. Uh, they don't. They don't see, uh, or they don't count the fact that they started this conflict. But anyway, uh, but the point is that if they carry out an attack, 
it will be to their detriment because from now on, the Iranian response will be much more severe. The commanders of the Iranian forces, armed forces, have said this. So next time, they won't. They shouldn't expect a couple of hundred drones and a you know tens of missiles or or whatever number the Iranians sent. They will be much more extensive, much uh, you know much larger in number and much more advanced. So it was a big loss for the Israeli regime. Big, and as I said, because, the West can pretend that it's otherwise, but that's fine. No, I think because everything was mystified. I mean, even I, I know even Iranian, within Iranian authorities, I mean, those who are more leaning towards the West and more liberal uh, elements, they were saying that don't do it. Israel is capable. Uh, nuclear power, America will come after them. They will have really kind of secretive weapons. And that was like this myth of Israel's uh, uh, undefeatable in, undefeatable force, military force, which is understandable. I mean, in this region, uh, Mr. Marandi, since 1947-48, Israel has always humiliated every single government from Nasser, Egypt's Nasser, to Anwar Sadat, who was so humiliated, who was forced to sit down on the... <laughs> Uh, negotiation table and sell away its uh, sovereignty to Jordan, which actually we're going to go through it, and I'm going to ask you a few questions about that, uh, who was complicit in the act yesterday, which is very funny. Jordan, for 191 days, has stayed silent and watched the massacre and genocide of Palestinian children. But when it comes to defending Israeli soil and sky, it runs to offer something to the master. It's, it's just so embarrassing. And Well, and actually this, again, it, you know, today they've been saying this is an excellent example of cooperation between the Arabs and the Israelis, and it shows that they're going to build a coalition against Iran. Again, this is just a propaganda model. This is not in the interests of the Jordanian regime. The Jordanian regime is only going to further anger their own population, which sees it as being obedient to the Israeli regime and uh, and supporting its policies. And the Jordanian po population despises the Israeli regime. So it is only diminishing the legitimacy of uh, the Jordanian state, the, the king, the, uh, the, the, uh, the government, uh, in the eyes of the public, and by diminishing that, it creates a, a greater environment for instability in the country in the future. What the West doesn't seem to understand is that they see the region as quiet. They say the Arabs want to do peace with, or, or they want to normalize with Israelis. No, these are not the Arabs. These are just a bunch of dictators that you've that you're supporting. That they've been installed in power. If if it was. If ordinary people had a say, they would all break off ties with the Israeli regime and go even further than that. So the United States misleads itself. The Israelis, the West mislead themselves by thinking that this is a plus. This is actually detrimental to their own interests for the Jordanian government to be seen as complicit with the Israeli regime. As a, you know, So everything looks calm across the region, but a lot of things are happening behind closed doors, uh, and that's what we saw in during the Arab Spring. Everything was quiet across the region, or the awakening, or the Islamic awakening, or whatever people would call it. Someone uh, killed himself in Tunisia, and regimes across North Africa uh, fell, and uh, instability uh, grew across the region, and the oil-rich dictatorships in the Persian Gulf were, were terrified. So, no, uh, Jordanian complicity actually benefits, in my opinion, in the so, long run, benefits the resistance because it delegitimizes the regime and thus it creates opportunities for the resistance to play a more powerful mm -hmm. role in Jordan or through Jordan in supporting the resistance in the West Bank. So, uh, as you see, I mean, this they are like promoting this news, something they should be they should be ashamed of. And as you said, it's going to cost them 
a lot with their own population. But as you said, I mean, because they are not democratic at all, they can they cannot worry about it immediately. But they they going to they going to pay. I, I think one of the one of the impacts and consequences of seventh of October will be a true Arab Spring this time, not a kind of a kind of engineered one because the the Arab masses saw how powerless and how uh, how utterly covered their estates are and how subservient towards American imperialism they are. So I think they're going to see. But but trying to do this, what this is this, they don't see the other side of the news. That means Princess Salma of Jordan was silent and inactive for 191 days during the genocide of Palestinians, a country that has, I think, 60-70% Palestinians themselves. That's the other side of this story, not that six Iranian drones was like uh, by this heroic person. And this, this is a very funny meme which came out. I'm sure you've seen it already, but it's worth watching it, that Iran is shooting Israel and Jordan is like making itself uh, sacrificially a shield for for Israel. I think that's 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 something that you want to watch. But I know you are very very tired. I just want to take you through few of these things and and let you go. Uh, so one of them is okay. Let's just go through one by one. That was this tweet by Scott Ritter, which I generally respect his military analysis, but. I think he says something which is not factually correct here. He says, eye for an eye, Iran strike Nevatim Air Base with at least seven of its new hypersonic missiles. And uh, Nevatim is home to the F-35 fighters that attacked the Iranian consulate in Damascus. Correct? Not a single Iranian missile was intercepted. Correct? Let that sink in. Israel is defenseless. Correct. But the first line is not correct. Iran didn't use its hypersonic missiles. Iran didn't need to do that. Uh, Mr. Marandi, which kind of weapons Iran used? Did it use its hypersonic Fatah or Fatah uh, 2, the last two, uh, the last hypersonic which was revealed after 7th of October or something much more outdated? No, Iran didn't use any of its most advanced uh, missiles. And... Um, uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, the Iranians don't want to give, uh, at this stage, uh, the Israeli regime and the Americans and uh, the others um, information about how their missiles function. So while the Iranians were able to use cheap drones and uh, older missiles to gather information about uh, Israeli defense capabilities and American defense capabilities and their co collective defense capabilities. Um, the Iranians didn't give anything really, uh, didn't give anything away in return. So Iran gained a huge amount of information uh, and made, forced them to make a, a, a costly uh, um, uh, defense, uh, or carry out a costly defense. And uh, on the other hand, the Iranians didn't give them any new information about their missile capabilities. Mm. That, that's exactly what I was going to ask, because in this exchange, lots of information has been passed. So, yes, they know a bit about Iranian uh, tactics. They know that Iran sends an army of cheap drones first and then missiles come after that, etc. But as you said, Iran didn't want to reveal its uh, its uh, most modern and most updated uh, missiles. Let me just give you one little anecdote because when I was interviewing people who are close to uh, forces in Lebanon back in October, then November, then December, then in January, and every time Lebanon was uh, targeted by Israel, especially by Israeli Air Force, Force and its F-35s, I asked them why Lebanon doesn't have any air defense system. Why Hezbollah doesn't intercept them? Doesn't Iran hasn't Iran 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 helped them with that? And this guy close to the forces says something very interesting. He said they have it, but they don't want to open their hand. They don't want to show their hand. They've kept it for later when the battle becomes more fierce and intense. And last week, yes, every every time the Israelis use their F-35s, which are not good planes, by the way. 
but they're they're very expensive and they break down. But in any case, every time the Israelis use these jets, intelligence is being gathered about their capabilities. So if a, a large war breaks out, the Israelis are going to be using their aircraft much more than what they're doing now in Gaza and in Lebanon. That's the time when the resistance will be re expo revealing their capabilities. By then, they will have all the information that they need to best use their uh, air defense capabilities or to acquire better defense capabilities. And the Israelis will be in a, a position of weakness. But let's say that they use their capabilities today. The Israeli regime will learn about their their cap capabilities and they'll devise ways to minimize uh, those capabilities. So what the resistance has been doing from day one is that they've been gathering information, but they've been with refraining from allowing the Americans and the Israelis to access adequate information. And that, I think, is key to uh, the, uh, the fate of this conflict at the end of the day. That's excellent. Okay, uh, let me just take you to a few more. Okay, so, 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 so the story about the Hezbollah guy, I'm sorry, and he said that Hezbollah doesn't want to use it until I, I didn't believe him. I had my, I had my uh, doubts until last week. When Hezbollah intercepted the ten million dollar Hermes nine hundred, the very expensive. Uh, it's not ten million dollars. I think it's eighty five million dollars. That's for the claim. But double check that. Double no, no, check that. The Israelis said ten million. I'm sure. I'm sure they might not be trusted. I mean, it doesn't matter. Yeah, but they claim it was like ten million. So, so in a, a, anyway. But that's like I think uh, that's a <laughs> really advanced phone. And so then I realized, yes, even Hezbollah has access to much more advanced. Uh, weaponry, but it doesn't want to reveal them yet. So that's one point. Let me just come take you to a few more points and let you go. And you're not going to sleep. You're going to have uh, next next uh, interview immediately. You're right. The, the Hermes 900 cost $5 million. Um, mm. But there was another drone that they downed that was much more expensive. So, but anyway. But let me just take, I think Vijay Prasha, which I hope that we will interview soon. Uh, he has this very interesting tweet. He says the Iranian drones over Israel are the product of two processes. The arrogance of the global north, which has treated the rest of the world like father, and the resistance of the global south, which has had enough. These two forces are now in direct collision. I think very interesting. But just is a reminder that these drones and missiles that we saw last night, is, there's a Everything is asymmetrical. As you said, four or five million dollars on the Iranian side, over one billion they claimed, but you say three billion on American and Israeli side. So the money spent last night on this big party are not equal on both sides. And one other thing, Israel didn't defend itself yesterday. There was a news which come out, came out from, from American uh, authorities. They said, all Iranian missiles were intercepted by American air defense system in its navy in the region. And I think that's a message in it. That means that, forget about Iron Dome, we did intercept them. We did it. That's, that's right. A Both, that's a it, it, sends two, it says two things. One is that the Americans are sending a message to the Israelis. And they're saying, your Iron Dome is useless. We are the ones who downed it. So Biden is mm -hmm. basically saying to the Israelis, that you owe me i'm the one who's taking care of you and so he's i think he's humiliating uh, netanyahu he's belittling netanyahu and saying look you're you 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 know i'm the one here who's uh, you know uh doing the heavy work but but also what it does say is that this 1.3 billion dollars at least uh if we apparently that's the price just of the missiles but it could be more but let's say this 1.3 billion dollars that has been spent that means that it's been almost exclusively spent or most of it's been spent by uh, it, the money's from american taxpayers 
So last night, American taxpayers paid $1 billion uh, so that uh, some uh, old inexpensive drones could mm. be shot down mm. uh, by the Israelis. So, but my point is, my point is, I mean, this is like what Vijay Prashad said, the other side of this asymmetry is the fact that Iran made everything very cheap, but also, don't forget, all the way till, I think, every week, uh, since 2017, 18, until very recently, we have been hearing about the necessity of putting sanctions. Here we go, I found it from 2023, I think, if it's not wrong. US issues new sanctions targeting Iran's missiles and drone programs, yeah? Iran has gone through, this, this missile that you see is the outcome of sanctions. For many of them, in order to get one little piece, because my first degree is in electronics, so I know a little, for getting a little piece and do reverse engineering on them, you had to order washing machine, you have to order something else, you have to go through very complicated network in order to get them and then open them up, reverse engineer, and then try to, to build them. And I think that, that's, that's amazing. It's like it's Global South par excellence is like, a, I'm not saying that Iran is a most of or downtrodden country, but it's coming from a very tough background in one side and the other side is a spoiled brat that America, UK, and we're very proud of the fact that even France helped it. So every major colonial power with 100 years of blood on their hand have come to pamper and, <laughs> and groom this little uh, criminal, psychopathic, uh, colonial, genocidal, apartheid regime of Israel to be able to defend itself against Iran's legitimate act of self-defense not even retaliation uh, against the consulate attack. So, so I think that's why that 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 image last night is very important. So, everything that you saw yesterday is made in Iran itself. So, Iran doesn't need any of them. Whereas those F thirty fives that Israel used yesterday, they were all <laughs> took off with the permission from Washington. If Washington tomorrow says, "I don't want them use them," I don't want Israel to use them. They cannot even open. They cannot even turn on the engine. That's it. So. That's the difference between them. There's one sovereign country here who decides, I want to... Yes, Israel. Israel is not a regional power. Israel is not it's an like, advanced country. Israel mm -hmm. is completely dependent on the United States, on the Europeans, on Germany, on Canada, Australia, for its security, for its uh, wealth, for its standard of living. It is a, a regime that, uh, if it's to be on its own, it wouldn't last more than a few weeks. And uh, mm -hmm. if the United States right now just simply uh, stop sending uh, ammunition to the Israelis, the, the war would end almost immediately. That's how dependent they are in every aspect. So, um, and, and I think that's the, one of the things that has been exposed over the past few months is the total reliance of the Israeli regime, that it and, and and that this is not a strong regime. This is a broken, weak, fra and uh, vulnerable regime. But it's extraordinary that because of the uh, Zionist lobby in the United States, that uh, the West is sacrificing so much for this regime, and most importantly, it's sacrificing its soft power, its standing, its credibility, its image across the world because of the genocide that they're supporting, a genocide being carried out by a regime that cannot stand independently. It has to rely on these Western regimes to continue with these massacres. I'm just going to quickly take you to a few of these like very symbolic images, I think, which is going to stay with us from last night. This is like Iranian missiles and drones over Knesset, yeah, and that means uh, that that's that's something very interesting because it's come very very close. But one, 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 the interesting thing was because these drones took a very long time to get there, and they had they had a very kind of chilled trip to 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 tell over, to, to to Israel. They were chilled. They stayed on the way in Karbala for a photo op. They also went above. Uh, 
Beit al Muqaddas, yeah, the holy, the holy mosque in in uh, Jerusalem as well. So, and these images, I think, they are going to do something with the psyche of of the people in the region. And I think uh, that 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 aspect is important as well. So, on the way, I'm just going to show I you. I think probably important images of uh, that will remain is the screaming and fear of the Israelis, which should remind them or at least their western backers of the fear and screaming of gazans as the bombs fall on their homes and uh, in their neighborhoods the only difference is that the iranians did not target civilian targets as we saw but the israeli regime and with the help of the west specifically targeted uh, civilian targets that's important because as we were talking yesterday and we were watching these things and you were very correct in saying that Iran didn't want to target any civilian. That's the difference. And one of the reasons, as you know, I mean, you know better than me, that that's why Ayatollah Khamenei were so uh, insistent on the fact that these missiles should not only go far, but they should be very precise. And I think I'm not, I don't think I'm mistaken if I say Iran has the most precise missile in the world because no other country needed to do that. But Iran... <laughs> worked on i think because that was like first 100 meters and they they, they reduce it to like 20 meters and i told how many say it's not enough 10 meters and i think five meters now yeah so you can go over 2000 kilometer and you can decide to go that five meters so unlike israelis who hit even they hit world central kitchen lorries not only once three times and they say oh that was oops that was a mistake iran's missiles have never ever hit mistakenly and they do uh, because because based on like I don't know their ethics and their code of conduct you are not allowed to kill like civilians that's that's the important thing uh, but as we were talking yesterday Israelis were doing this kind of propaganda and they were proud of it yeah saying like Israel before and after the Iranian attack and then they would go down to show um, the other side was uh, Iran before and after the attack, yeah, and they were like playing with the idea that we will nuke you. So, so I think that's an interesting thing. I want to stop one second because you know Israel, Israel has usurped and bought off a big part of Iranian opposition abroad, from Reza Pahlavi, Shah San to Masi Ali Nejad and others. And I think that's I, I welcome that kind of sadistic propaganda. Israel is threatening. 10 million people in Tehran, including you and my family who are still there, that they will nuke them. So let the Iranians see those who are supporting the opposition. I think it's even uh, more, what's, what's even more disgusting is that uh, the Israelis have been threatening uh, Iran, they've been threatening the Palestinians with nuclear weapons, and no one in the West mm. will mm. Uh, complain about this. No one will condemn this. No one will warn this not to warn them not to uh, continue with this sort of language uh, and that just shows that the, the west has uh, no normal no moral values They're, the issue is not uh, that they've lost their moral compass it's, it's that they have no moral compass they are in this uh, with the israelis they are do they're in this together this is their genocide. This is their Holocaust in Gaza, as uh, you know, as it's been compared to the Holocaust in the Second World War by the uh, Brazilian president. Let me just kind of take you towards the end by showing this from Israeli president. I think it's like very funny. Last thing that Israel is seeking in this region since its creation is to go to war. We are seeking peace. We are peace seekers. So the last thing that Israel is going through want is going through the war in this region. And then someone... Yes, really... and, and like almost all other leaders, he's, he's not even from the region. But, but, but the beauty uh, of social media is this one, Mr. Marandi. Someone immediately... Put the last thing that Israel is seeking in this region since its creation is to go to war. We are seeking peace. We are peace seekers. So the last thing that Israel immediately is... they put him 
writing on missiles <laughs> sent in to kill children. Yes, and remember, he is, he, is the, he is the person who said that there are no innocent people in Gaza at the very beginning, meaning that children are mm. legitimate targets. Uh, and in the South African uh, complaint lodged to the ICJ, uh, it was well documented. So if you allow me, I just want to show one. These, these genocidal statements. Five seconds. I, I must go you shortly go, go, because go, go. Uh, okay. uh, Chinese television is they are going constantly to, sending You're not going to speak Chinese with them, are you? Sorry, no. no, no, no. You're going to speak. No. But all right. So anyway, we're going to stop here. But I think I may have actually have another show tomorrow in English because there are so much material. And I think this... Uh, the media aspect is, I think, is not equally important, but is an important part of this because in Anul Assad, Americans managed not to allow the public understand the significance and the depth of Iranian attack. And here, Israelis are exactly doing the same thing to keep the public and the Western public unaware of uh, the fact that the deterrence, despite all the taxpayers' money abroad, is not even working and so a country under sanction like iran who cannot even buy medicine for his cancer patients has managed to with persistence and with resilience and with uh, with resistance to build up a military capability which has embarrassed america and also to produce most of its itself own cancer mm. medicine and all, all other and other types of medicines. So I think I think that's important. So we're going to have another show tomorrow, and I'm going to let Mr. Marandi to continue being a global star. So um, our YouTube channel is <laughs> only can keep him one hour. Well, apart from joke, he's always been very very generous with me in Persian You're and now in English. Thank you very much, and see you uh, the audience tomorrow. Please subscribe, please like, and write a comment. And let us come to English and have our show there. Good night and see you tomorrow. Goodbye for now.